Today is October the 28th. Today we see the start of Jesus' ministry. As we read through the Bible in a year today, I'd like you to read Luke chapters 4 to 6. Now, this is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, and it's interesting. The beginning of Jesus' ministry is his temptation in the desert. At the end of the temptation, it says that the devil had finished, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, the devil left Jesus until the next opportunity came. Although Jesus casts out demons in the center of the book of Luke, we don't have mention of the devil until Luke chapter 20 or 21, when it says, and the devil entered into Judas Iscariot. The devil couldn't combat Jesus, so he attacked one of Jesus' followers. Jesus was betrayed and then crucified. Now, at the start of Jesus' ministry in Nazareth, Jesus goes to the synagogue. He had been gone for a while, and as was traditional, when a uh, traveler comes back home, they let him do the scripture reading. Uh, the scripture reading was set. Uh, there was a reading for each Sabbath, and Jesus was to read the reading for that Sabbath. But scripture says very specifically that Jesus unrolled the scroll and he searched and he found a different passage from the one that he was supposed to read. And he read instead from the book of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He's sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, the oppressed will be set free, and the time of the Lord's favor has come. That begins Jesus' ministry. And in that, uh, it's, it's uh, incredibly, incredibly powerful, that passage. It's a messianic prophecy in the book of Isaiah, in which the prophet says the Messiah will come and do all of this. Jesus says, I am here to do this. He rolls up the scroll, hands it to the attendant, sits down and says, today that passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Immediately they take him out to stone him, to throw him off of a mountain peak of a, uh, one of the uh, cliffs near Nazareth. Uh, Jesus walks out. Uh, he, he leaves them. Uh, they're unable to do what they went. Luke records opposition to Jesus from the very start of his ministry. Now, the ministry itself jumps back and forth between three things. First of all, healing. Jesus casts out a demon. He heals many people. He, he heals the sick. He cleanses leopards. He exercises demons from those who are demonized. The second element, Jesus preaches. At the end of chapter 4, he continues to preach and uh, preaches both to a few, the discussion about fasting in chapter 5, and to crowds. The third thing that he does, he disciples. He begins by calling Simon and Andrew, James and John, who were by boats at the beginning of chapter 5. He calls Levi at the end of chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, he formalizes the appointment of 12. Healing, teaching, and discipling. That summarizes Jesus' activity as Jesus 
the man God who is Messiah introduces God's kingdom to earth. Enjoy today as you read Luke 4 to 6. Luke 4 through 6, New Living Translation, Luke 4. Then Jesus, filled of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for forty days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. The devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you worship me. Jesus replied, The scriptures say, You must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, He will order His angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Then Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, You must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scriptures you've just heard has been filled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said, You will undoubtedly quote me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself, meaning, do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own town. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years, and a severe famine destroyed the land. Yet Elisha was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath, in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elijah. But the only one healed was Naamah, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and taught there in the synagogue every Sabbath day. There, too, the people were amazed at his teaching, for he spoke with authority. Once he was in the synagogue, a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit, cried out, shouting, Go away! Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet! Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the demon threw the man on the floor as the crowd watched. Then it came out of him without hurting him further. Amazed, the people exclaimed, What authority and power this man's words possess! Even evil spirits obey him, and they flee at his command. The news about Jesus spread through every village in the entire region. After leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home, where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. Standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. As the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, 
the touch of his hand healed every one. Many were possessed by demons, and the demons came out at his command, shouting, You are the Son of God. But because they knew he was the Messiah, he rebuked them and refused to let them speak. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him, and when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns, too, because that is why I was sent. So he continued to travel around, preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. Luke 5 One day Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper, and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me, I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners James and John were the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, can you heal me and make me clean? Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus instructed him not to tell anyone what had happened. He said, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even further, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. One day, while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as Jerusalem, and the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came, carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. So they lowered the sick man on his mat into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home, praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, Why do you eat and drink with such scum? 
Jesus answered them, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. One day, some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Jesus responded, Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not, but some day the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Then Jesus gave them this illustration. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment, for then the new garment would be ruined, and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. So no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored in new wineskins, but no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old wine is just fine, they say. Luke 6. On the Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples broke off heads of grain, rubbed off the husks into their hands, and ate the grain. But some Pharisees said, Why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus replied, Haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread only the priests can eat. He also gave some to his companions, and Jesus added, The Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. On another Sabbath day, a man with a deformed right hand was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teacher of religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew their thoughts. He said to the man with the deformed hand, Come and stand in front of everyone. So the man came forward. Then Jesus said to his critics, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them one by one, and then said to the man, Hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored. At this, the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all his disciples and chose twelve of them to be apostles. Here are their names, Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. When they came down from the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large, level area, surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. There were people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from as far north as the sea coast of Tyre. They had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases, and those troubled by evil spirits were healed. Everyone tried to touch him, because healing power went out from him, and he healed everyone. Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God bless you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God bless you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. God bless you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When this happens, be happy. Yes, leave for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets that same way. What sorrow awaits you who are rich? For you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now? For a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now? For your laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? For their ancestors also praised false prophets. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, 
Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only for those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Then Jesus gave the following instructions. Can one blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, Friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So why do you keep calling me, Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground, without a foundation. When the flood sweeps down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Scripture reading by Emily Herrera. Like, follow, and subscribe to this devotional on whatever platform you use to listen to it. Email your questions to us at questions at becomehope.com. Tomorrow, we'll see hope, humility, and honor in the Psalms of Ascent. If you live in the Greenwood, Indiana area and you're looking for a church, we'd love to have you come and visit us at New Hope tomorrow. We're at 5307 West Fairview Love Road. Our service starts at 10 a.m. I look forward to seeing you there.